Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Environmental justice, a movement dating back to the civil rights era, is defined by EPA as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. The movement has gained new momentum in recent years. With the transition to the Biden-Harris administration, we have already started to see unprecedented attention to environmental justice, or EJ, by the federal government with early executive actions. Even before the Biden-Harris campaign brought EJ back into the federal spotlight, however, states were starting to implement EJ-focused legislation, a trend that has continued into 2021. In today's episode of the ELI Diverging Diamond Environmental Justice Ground Truth podcast series, we'll hear from Gwen Keyes Fleming, a partner at Van Ness Feldman, whose practice focuses on environmental policy, including EJ, government relations, and enforcement defense. She previously served as the EPA Region 4 Administrator, during which time she revamped the region's EJ efforts. Gwen will talk to Mustafa Ali, Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization, the National Wildlife Federation, about Justice 40, an initiative launched by the Biden administration under the January 27, 2021 executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. Under Justice 40, 40% of the overall benefits from specific federal investments will be directed towards disadvantaged communities. Qualifying federal investments include energy efficiency, clean energy, training and workforce development, and the development of clean water infrastructure. Thanks, Gwen, for joining us today. I'm eager to hear more about Justice 40. Thanks, Heather. Before we get started, I'll share some background information on our guest today, Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa Santiago Ali is a thought leader, strategist, policymaker, community liaison, facilitator, and activist committed to the fight for environmental justice and economic equity. He currently serves as the Vice President of Environmental Justice, Climate, and Community Revitalization for the National Wildlife Federation. Prior to joining NWF, Mustafa served as Senior Vice President for the Hip Hop Caucus, a national nonprofit and nonpartisan organization that connects the hip hop community to the civic process to build power and create positive change. He also worked at EPA for 24 years, including serving as a founding member of the agency's Office for Environmental Justice. Mustafa, we're thrilled to have you with us today. Well, it's an honor to be with you, Gwen. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So let me set the stage. The Biden administration announced a new initiative called Justice 40 in January of 2021. This is an initiative where at least 40% of the federal benefits or federal investments in climate and clean energy are targeted to go towards disadvantaged communities. Since January, as directed by the Biden executive order, Shalanda Young, Deputy Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Brenda Mallory, Chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, and our former boss, Gina McCarthy, White House National Climate Advisor, collectively have issued interim implementation guidance for Justice 40. The interim guidance launched a pilot program that comprised of 21 priority programs to immediately begin enhancing benefits for disadvantaged communities. The White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council, or WEJAC, has also issued recommendations on Justice 40's implementation. Before we get into some of the work that the government is doing, let's take a step back. You've been doing this work, Mustafa, for over 25 years, and I just want to get a sense from you, what are you seeing on the ground? What have you experienced in communities that have suffered under uh, overburden of pollution? Help paint the picture for us. Yeah, you know, often we talk about the impacts. I'd like to start off by also painting the picture about the beauty and the culture um, and and all the positives that are happening inside of uh, our most vulnerable communities, the families that are there that continue each and every day to do everything that they can to provide for their children, for the next generation. 
Um, and we call that out because we have to protect that. You know, we protect that in so many other communities across our country um, that often are not communities of color, are often not lower wealth communities, are often not indigenous brothers and sisters. So when we see these impacts, we understand what we are fighting for um, and what we're trying to defend. And, and what you see is that, you know, we have impacts that are happening in a number of different ways. And systemic racism plays a part, policy plays a part, um, and, and what's happening inside of these communities, the communities that have been redlined and restrictive covenances that have been put in place and, and bad zoning practices that, that allow the creation of sacrifice zones. Inside of these sacrifice zones, we, we find high levels of air pollution. We've got over 200,000 people who die prematurely in our country every year from air pollution. And many of them are black and brown and lower wealth white communities, Asian and Pacific Islander and indigenous brothers and sisters. We got 24 million folks who are suffering from asthma. And again, you find that predominantly those who are being disproportionately not only impacted, but have higher rates of asthma are black and brown communities and especially black and brown kids. So you go to places like the 48217 in Detroit. So when kids look out their window, um, instead of seeing trees and green space, they see the piping uh, and the flaring that goes on in plants. You see places like Cancer Alley that has the highest level of cancer uh, in our country. It's a community, a thriving community in the sense of them trying to hold on to their culture um, that was founded by freed enslaved people. And then for as far as the eye can see, these petrochemical facilities have surrounded these communities and are impacting their health. You have places like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas, a hardworking Latinx community. And on some days when you go there, you roll down the windows of your car, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes and people are expected to live, and people are also expected um, to be able to have their kids get a good education, but it's extremely difficult from the things that are going on. You've got situations like Benton Harbor, Michigan, that now has higher levels of lead in its water than Flint, Michigan did, and we know the devastation that happened in Flint. So we've got these impacts that are happening from air pollution, water pollution, uh, pollution that's on our land, that often stops folks from being able to grow produce so that they can address the food injustice issues. These are just a few of the types of situations that are going on along with housing injustice and transportation injustice. And I would be remiss if I didn't call out that when you look at many of these communities, you will also find that there um, is voting injustice or voter suppression that also plays a role um, in many of the decisions that are made. And that's why we have to take a holistic approach to addressing these issues. So Mustafa, you've said so much right there. I think I uh, love that you have broken this down into the commonality of uh, desiring to protect one's family, desiring to have uh, one's children have all of the advantages and just have clean air and clean water. I recall from my own experience, many times with you on the ground when I was the region four administrator in some of these communities. And I can relate to what you're saying in terms of you're in the community for only 15 or 30 minutes and you're noticing a tickle in your throat or you're, you're trying to cough. And it really brings home the fact that these aren't academic exercises. This isn't hypothetical work. This is very real to people who look like you and me, and even if they don't, it's just the notion that they are trying again to protect their families, to do right by their families and do what's best for them. And I think that message gets lost sometimes as we try to put people in boxes. Well, Gwen, you know, it comes down to this for me because sometimes we just have to simplify it um, because others will try and complicate it. You know, this is about basic human rights. Everyone should have the right to be able to breathe in air that is not going to um, be uh, devastating to the body, that's not going to cause, um, you know, these medical conditions, these uh, cancers, these liver and kidney diseases, these breathing difficulties. Everyone should be able to have a drink of clean and affordable water. That is a basic human right. You can't live without air and you can't live without water. Um, so everyone should be able to agree that whether we're talking about folks across our country or across the planet, that everyone should be able to enjoy those basic human rights. 
And something else that you you spoke about in terms of, or what you taught me about in environmental justice as I, uh, again, joined EPA, is the notion that everybody, or these communities in particular, deserve a seat at the table when decisions are being made about their health, about uh, plants or facilities or initiatives or rulemakings that are gonna impact that health. Can, can you talk a little bit about uh, being given that opportunity to have a say in what happens in your community and how that opportunity is often denied uh, people that live in environmental justice communities? No, no, thank you for the question because you know, it's interesting, uh, even in the language that we use, you know, to, to think that someone has to be given the right to be able to, to be at the table, to, to be able to engage in a process um, around policy or reg development or statutes um, that is going to impact their lives and the members of their community, either in a positive or a negative way, um, speaks to the paradigm, that 20th and 19th century paradigm uh, that many have followed in the past. You know, a 21st century paradigm actually makes sure that that is just an automatic part of the process. That not only do we have a seat at the table, but that our voices also help to frame out um, the sets of actions and investments um, that are critical to making sure that we have healthy communities. You know, other communities that have privilege, uh, that have time, um, that have resources, don't have uh, such a difficult time in being able to participate in many of the federal processes or state processes or county or local government processes. So we've got to make sure that for communities of color, um, that not only that there's real engagement about what's going on, but that there's real opportunity and vehicles that make sure um, that those who are most vulnerable um, have the ability to frame out a new direction, a, a more inclusive direction um, that in the ultimate analysis will benefit everyone inside of our country. So again, you've been doing this work for a long time. What, if anything, is unique about this moment where uh, to provide re redress? Well, there are a number of um, transformative things that have happened and are continuing to evolve. Um, the first one is, is that there are light bulbs that have finally gone off, that you can have a conversation um, about racism, systemic racism, without many people recoiling away from that conversation. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and a number of other movements over the last couple of years it really put a spotlight on the injustices that were going on and people began to have deeper sets of conversations uh, about a number of different aspects uh, in life in our country um, that have been impacted. The second part which is critically important is that we now have leadership um, that is not just talking the talk but also beginning to walk the walk um, and making sure that the various vehicles um, that needed to be put in place and the capacity that needed to be built. Um, and then also the, the structures um, are actually, um, you know, growing um, and being instituted. And then the third part, which if you don't have this part, the other two, um, you know, will not get you as far um, as you would hope to be, is resources. Uh, you and I both know that over the years, when we talk about the work that happened in the environmental justice space, lots of times it was because of relationships that were built and not so much because there was significant resources um, to, to help to get the work done. Now, you know, for the first time and all the time that I've been doing this work, and I started working on social justice, you know, a long time ago, is that, you know, the president and his administration um, is dedicating real resources to trying to redress many of these impacts that have happened. Foundations have begun to shift their portfolios to better support this work, to um, uplift uh, frontline organizations and also push those uh, other organizations, like some people label them as big green or national uh, environmental and climate organizations that they have to do better as well if they wanna have access to those resources. So for me, that third leg of the stool is completely um, and, and definitely needed um, to be able to make sure that real change can happen because it can't happen without resources. So let's, let's turn to that because as we think about resources, uh, one of the new initiatives that the Biden administration is putting forth is Justice 40, 
Uh, I understand that it had its underpinnings or, or its uh, origins in the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act in New York. But one of the things that this new initiative says is that federal investments, uh, now 40% of federal investments need to go to uh, disadvantaged communities. And, and let me say at least 40%. It's not, that is supposed to be the floor, not the ceiling. But let's, as you know, with government and as you develop policy, very often uh, you need to provide definitions and guidance documents and those kinds of things. So the guidance document from OMB has a specific definition of disadvantaged communities that's based on 13 indicators. Uh, but let me step back from that a minute. In your view, is there a difference in the terminology of disadvantaged communities versus overburdened communities versus vulnerable communities? Are these just legalistic terms or do they really have different meanings in your view? Well, I think a lot of it is legalistic. Um, you know, folks are trying to give framework to, to, you know, to the impacts that are going on. Um, and as long as there are commonalities that exist between the three, then I think you can crosswalk. Um, I, I think eventually we will get to, you know, one um, sort of overarching umbrella that folks will work from. But when you unpack many of those, um, you, you know, you, you see that they're really speaking the same language. I think that we should just call out that, you know, one of the other aspects that, that's important um, is understanding that when we're talking about environmental injustice or when we're talking about environmental racism, excuse me, then um, for some lower wealth white communities, um, they, they felt that that may not necessarily have captured some of the impacts that are happening inside of their communities. Um, so that's one of the areas that I think folks are gonna have to make sure um, that they're thinking through as well. But those other three terms that you, that you referenced, the, the commonalities are more than the differences. Well, and it's interesting that you make that last point, because again, I remember as RA, I think you may have joined us on the ground in Kentucky, uh, dealing with some mountaintop mining issues. And we made the decision that the community there uh, would be considered an environmental justice community, despite it being uh, a majority white community, because we saw a lot of the similarities in terms of not just the environmental burdens, but also uh, the lack of access to resources, the lack of um, ability to or, or opportunity to speak up for themselves, for their own protections. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, when you go to places like Appalachia, you know, one of the places that I grew up, um, you see very similar sets of dynamics to, that, that are happening in the Black Belt or are happening on the Gulf Coast or a number of other locations across our country. So we want to make sure that you know, wherever injustice might be, um, that there is an opportunity for folks to, to be able to be made whole again. Um, and in the early days of the environmental justice movement, um, there were lower wealth white communities, you know, who are also a part of those conversations and continue to be um, in, in pockets across our country. Folks will sometimes uh, try and separate folks and, and pit one against the other. You know, I, I really appreciate the work that uh, Reverend Barber uh, picked up from Dr. King around the Poor People's Campaign and, and helping folks to understand the commonalities um, in, in their in their fights for justice. Um, so we have to just make sure that all of our brothers and sisters know that we're in it together and that we're going to work to protect uh, each and every one. Now, with that being said, we also understand from all of the studies over the years that race is a greater predictor of many of these impacts uh, than socioeconomic status, but socioeconomic status definitely um, also plays a role. If you're poor and you're white, um, you're much more likely to be impacted than if you are upper middle income or, or wealthy white community. So with that being said, we just wanna make sure that we understand um, that, that you know, the racial component um, definitely is a stronger predictor, but not the only predictor. And I, I think the these 13 indicators, at least in the definition in this guidance document, speaks to that point. They, they talks about low income, high or persistent poverty, linguistic isolation, which is another thing that, that we haven't talked about in depth yet. But it also talks about high unemployment rates, disproportionate impacts from climate change and other things. And what struck me 
about these 13 indicators is how it goes beyond traditional environmental uh, indicators and speaks to housing, it speaks to transportation, and just makes me think about the interconnectivity of our environment with so many other aspects that also need attention. So when we hear the Biden administration talk about a whole of government approach to include housing, to include transportation, to include energy, how do you see that as an opportunity to bring real transformational change? Well, you have to have a holistic approach because communities are not segmented. You know, we've often over the years in, in the government context, you know, we'll have one agency or department to come in uh, or one program inside of there and, and folks will do some work and then leave. Um, but there's still a suite of other challenges that still go on and a suite of other opportunities that are there. You know, the beauty of the interagency working group, which I led, um, and that I know you uh, participated in and, and, and others, you know, was that you brought a number of different federal agencies and departments together uh, to begin to address the issues that were happening inside of communities. And we've seen projects that when uh, that holistic approach um, was utilized, that it was just transformative. So for the Biden administration to kind of strengthen that, uh, to lift it to another level is definitely the right direction to go into because you know that's the things that communities are actually asking for they're asking for us to leverage you know the resources the expertise um, that exists in different agencies and, and departments across the federal family um, and, and, and it allows us to really take a holistic view of communities um, so they're moving in the right direction and bringing these new sets of indices in um, is incredibly important also. And one of the reasons is because we know that there has been biases and discrimination uh, and racism in policy, um, whether we're talking about transportation policy or housing policy uh, or environmental policy, or you know, we can go down the laundry list. Um, so now we get a chance to actually unpack and dismantle um, those aspects that might still um, you know, find um, I don't want to say fertile ground, but still find existence here in the 21st century. Um, and, and this is some of the tools that can do it. Um, and, and there are opportunities as time moves on to be able to bring other uh, aspects into this overall sets of analyses. And I think, uh, would, would you agree that there's some great examples that we can build upon? The Regenesis Project in South Carolina comes to mind, where I know uh, Harold Mitchell there was able to leverage a small, relatively small EJ grant into literally billions of dollars of benefits by uh, expanding the net to include other federal family partners, including the Department of Justice in, uh, in terms of block grants, in, including uh, HHS for some health centers and things. So uh, it would be great to be able to see that type of project idea replicated through some of this uh, with this new energy that we're seeing from the federal government without a doubt i mean you hit it right on the head i mean you know um, there at the regenesis project they took a twenty thousand dollar grant uh, and have leveraged it time and time and time and time again over you know doing all the things that when you look at polling folks are asking for making sure that folks have access to uh, affordable health care and accessible health care, making sure new housing is in place, changing bad transportation routes, cleaning up brownfields and Superfund sites, um, you know, uh, creating a whole new suite of jobs and some people creating their own businesses now. Um, and then also, you know, starting to also be focused on bringing in clean energy uh, sets of opportunities, which will lower people's electricity costs even further. So that's one example. But you have Miss Margaret May in Kansas City in the Ivanhoe community, who's been able to take small amounts of money and leverage them into millions of dollars of change and making sure there's new green space and new housing um, and, and other economic opportunities. You can look at the work of Diane Takvorian and Carolina Martinez in the Environmental Health Coalition in San Diego um, and how they've been able to you know, deal with some very contentious situations and get new and affordable housing in uh, to create jobs, to address the environmental impacts. Or Gwen, you can look at the faith-based examples because you got to have all kinds of different examples for folks about how change is happening. You can look at the work of 
Reverend Buster Soras in Jersey City or Reverend Floyd Flake up in Jamaica, Queens, or the amazing work that Bethel New Life has done on the south side of Chicago. Um, and, and all of these different examples, you know, often are not cited. And, and some of them um, are some of the most dynamic examples of how community-based work, building authentic collaborative partnerships um, can make real change happen. And, and they're hitting it from a number of different directions. And the ultimate uh, result is healthier and more sustainable and vibrant communities, something that we continue to say that, that, that we wanna support. So we should really be highlighting these examples that um, are done by communities of color who often start with very, very small amounts of money and have been, have been able to outperform uh, individuals uh, who have gotten millions of dollars as their as their um, starting point. So um, I hope that the administration will really embrace these and, and share them as examples of how success can happen, whether you're in the urban, the rural, or the suburban context. So let's um, get back, as I, you and I could talk about these topics all day, and I'm so glad that you included some real world examples because Again, I think for all of the attention, for all of the history of the environmental justice movement and all of the attention that is getting recently, uh, it's some of these stories still get lost. And it's important, uh, one, to let folks know that there has been success through some of the mechanisms that you described, uh, but that, too, that can be replicated. And so in my, as I think through how to replicate it for communities that don't know where to start, uh, what advice do you have for them or, or how can they build the partnership? Do they, um, you know, where would EJ Screen be helpful in helping folks come together and understand the data to be able to go forward? And I, I know that the WeJack has made recommendations for a new climate and economic justice screening tool that would be overlaid with EJ Screen. How do we go about building those relationships and partnerships so that when the resources come, uh, everybody is moving in the right direction? Well, you know, the first part is always, you know, educating ourselves. And there are a number of different places that folks can go to, to begin that journey if they you know, um, uh, haven't been able to start it yet, um, or there's aspects that they want to strengthen. So, you know, first place I always ask people to start with are the environmental justice networks that are out there, um, just so you can begin to, to learn about other examples um, of how folks have been navigating these issues for years and what some of the priorities are. The EPA is also a, an excellent place to begin the journey. Um, because there are trainings. So you can currently learn how to utilize EJ Screen, uh, which will give you um, a good footing so that when the new tool comes out, um, that you'll already have many of the basics uh, under your belt to be able to, to navigate what's going on there. Uh, CEQ will also be uh, sharing some trainings um, and helping people to better understand some of these steps that are going on. And then there are a number of historically black colleges and universities and other uh, majority institutions that also have been doing a lot of great work in helping communities um, to be able to learn how to utilize some of these tools. The University of Michigan has done some great work. Um, you've got great work that's been happening, you know, um, over at Howard and FAM and a number of other uh, colleges as well. Um, there's there's a number of them, so I hope no one gets mad at me because I didn't call out this group. <laughs> That, that's the downside of starting to call names. I understand, I understand. So uh, let me ask this, because one of the questions that I get uh, often is, um, how, how do you define benefits? Or recognizing that every community's needs are different, mm -hmm. how do you know that the work has hit the mark? And you're well, delivering in a way that the community really needs. Well, that's where real community engagement comes in. And as you are developing um, these processes, you have to have a continual set of engagements and transparency that's happening, um, especially when you're talking about being able um, to sort of quantify um, or analyze what benefits actually look like. 
um, because benefits, as you've said, to, to one area or one community um, may be different than others. Um, I've had my own struggles, to be quite honest, when we have the conversation around benefits instead of resources, um, because a benefit could be, you know, that we're cleaning up an airshed, right? So everyone's air starts to get better, but you're not drilling down on the disproportionate areas um, that have, you know, uh, traditionally and historically uh, been impacted. Um, so, you know, but then you have other types of examples and situations where it's a lot more easy to, to quantify the benefits. You know, if we're, you know, removing old lead lines uh, and replacing them. Um, so that's why there has to be a lot of work. There has to be um, these continual sets of conversations and you have to be willing uh, to evolve your process um, if you're not getting the types of results that you're looking for. Um, I would be remiss if I also didn't call out the fact that I would like to make sure or see us um, do a better job uh, on the dollar side of the equation, uh, being focused on vulnerable communities. I know that there are some challenges um, in that space. There are challenges um, because we usually move money uh, through existing um, vehicles and those existing vehicles in the past haven't always um, gotten to the communities that have been unseen and unheard and disinvested in uh, in a significant way. So there's work um, that has to happen in that space. Um, the other part, when that we have to call out real quickly, um, is also the work that has to happen on the state level uh, to build capacity and accountability. So you got to build the capacity. Um, or you're asking folks, it's almost like giving them an unfunded mandate. Um, and then the other part of it is you got to hold people accountable. We often don't have real conversations about the dynamics that are going on across our country and the fact that we've got a set of states that have never uh, been interested um, in environmental justice, have never been interested in, in climate change or, or the climate crisis in any significant way and, and doing the work that's necessary. Um, so we, we've got to be able to think really critically about how we're going to ensure that, um, you know, whether we're talking about resources or benefits actually makes it to the communities that need them the most. Well, and, it, and again, it, as you talk, you're just bringing back so many great memories uh, for me. But that was one of our big challenges, again, in the region is the communities that needed it most very often didn't have the structure to be able to go through the auditing process that's required or come up with match funds for various federal grants. And so that's really how CUP was initiated, the Communities and Underserved Colleges and Underserved Communities Partnership Program, so that we could build that capacity uh, through some of the local colleges, partnering with federal agencies, uh, and again, just trying to fill these gaps to make sure that everyone has the ability to apply for some of this funding. Yeah, I mean, that that's a phenomenal program. You know, there are other things that we can be doing as well. We have these accelerator programs and incubator programs that are going on across the country right now to try and help people to get prepared uh, for these new sets of opportunities and resources that are gonna move. Uh, many of our organizations um, that, that you and I are associated with um, can also do more in this space to help uh, vulnerable communities with the capacity that they need. You know, for those who are in the legal profession, you know, there are opportunities to, to be able to help folks navigate um, some of the, you know, needs that they have. For those who are in the accounting field, um, you know, the, the two biggest things that I've often heard from communities in relationship to capacity are three, actually. One is on the legal side. The other one is on the bookkeeping side. Um, and then the last one that, that folks will often talk about is being able to, um, you know, write these um, grants. So, you know, whether we're talking about, you know, the national black MBAs um, or MBAs in general, um, or a number of these other associations beginning to get more engaged with communities, we can really help be a part of that transformation that literally is at our fingertips. Well, and that also expands uh, the net to, to demonstrate it's not just 
the legal community, uh, but all of us have a part in making sure that these communities get the redress that they so need. I, I wanna turn a minute to accountability. As we think about Justice 40, as we think about being accountable to communities, there's been talk of a scorecard. Um, how do you see the accountability aspect of making sure the communities get the necessary resources? How should that work in your mind? Well, I, I think there are a number of different ways of approaching that. You know, from the EPA side of the ledger, since we both spent some time there, um, you know, we have these performance partnership agreements um, with states um, and with the agency um, and finding ways of building language in there. Of course, that's tied to the performance partnership grants as well, that resources that go to the states. So we should be looking for opportunities um, to make sure that the proper criteria is inside. Um, so that it really strengthens this overall process and, and you get what you need out of it. The other part has got to be um, also around other forms of transparency. I, I appreciate the, the scorecard concept um, because it really uh, puts a spotlight on who's doing a good job um, and who still has some, some growing to do or some evolving to do. And hopefully um, there won't be folks who, you know, who get, um, you know, a really bad score because they're just not doing it right at all. But if that's the case, then we've got to figure out what are going to be the steps for those who are falling short. Um, so, you know, we can get this stuff right. Now, the question is, are folks willing to lean in enough, um, you know, for states who, you know, one, have been given, you know, the resources that would be necessary for them to build capacity? Um, and the training, um, because we've seen in the past that, that sometimes um, you know, when folks have fallen short that, you know, we've, we've been more on the carrot side, which I, I appreciate the carrot um, and have tried to utilize that throughout my career. But there also comes the time when, you, when you've got to hold people really accountable when, for whatever reasons, um, you've done everything you can to, to, to get them moving in the right direction and they refuse to. Um, so that's for a deeper set of conversations um, about That'll what be the next podcast. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't want to get y'all shut down. <laughs> well, let, let's go back to where we started and, and talk about what justice means. It's entitled Justice 40. We are talking about environmental justice. What does that look like to you? Well, for me, th there's two sides of that coin. Uh, the first side is the needs. Uh, for those who have been victimized, the needs for those who have been disproportionately impacted um, and being able to address those needs. Um, the other side of the coin, which we often don't talk about, um, is, you know, if we've been able to address the impacts and stop those impacts from happening or minimize those impacts, is being able to utilize this new clean economy that everyone continues to talk about and other sets of opportunities that, that help to build wealth inside of these communities, that, that help to bring jobs to these communities. Um, I, I'm thinking about it in a very holistic way, um, both the impact side and the opportunity side. Well, I can't imagine a better place to end our discussion with that vision of hope. I am so thankful, Mustafa, that you were able to join us today and for sharing your insights with us. Well, Gwen, thank you for having me. And just let me say thank you for everything that you've done over the years. Many folks may not know all of the incredible work that you've done and all of the, the folks that you have lifted up, myself included. Um, so I just want to publicly once again say thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you. It's been a great partnership. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you. So please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.